I'm Isaiah Lankamp. And I'm Matthew Slaughter. And this is Everything is Better with Friends, using SAS in Python applications with SASPy and open source tools. We could not be more excited to bring you this virtual tutorial for SAS Global Forum 2020, in which we are going to present the best of both worlds. We're going to show you how to take SAS and use its strengths for data analysis, data management, and statistics, and how to combine them with Python, the world's most popular programming language, or at least soon to be so, which has strengths including scripting, web development, and a huge open source community. In fact, the community is so big and so welcoming that it's what allows us to have SASPy, which is a package for the Python language that acts as an interface for the SAS system, allowing us to use SAS and Python together. Before we explain what that means, let's take a step back for a moment and think about the way we usually use SAS. There are a number of different interfaces to the SAS system. Many of you may be familiar with the SAS Display Manager, as well as SAS Enterprise Guide. And some of you may even be using the latest SAS Studio. Of course, many of you may also have to submit SAS code in batch mode, possibly from a command line. Ultimately, all of these interfaces operate in a similar fashion in that the interface submits SAS code to the SAS kernel, which executes that code and reads and writes SAS datasets from disk as needed. Then the SAS kernel returns the result of the, that code and a log for the execution of it to the SAS interface and reports it all back to you, the programmer. What we're going to show you today is a way to use Python to interact with the SAS kernel rather than one of these SAS interfaces. And in particular, what we're going to do in this tutorial is we're going to start with a Python interface, not a SAS interface. And the Python interface we're going to start with is called JupyterLab. And it is a way of using SAS University Edition, which is free software that you can download and install. We have complete instructions for how to do that on our GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash saspy dash BFFs, BFF standing for best friends forever, which is what we hope you will believe SAS and Python can be after this tutorial. So we're going to use JupyterLab as a Python interface to submit Python code to a Python kernel. And then through the power of SASPy, the Python kernel on our behalf is going to submit SAS code to a SAS kernel. The SAS kernel is going to do what it normally does. It's going to read and write SAS data sets from disk as necessary. It's going to munge all the SAS code for us. It's going to return SAS log and SAS results for us to the Python kernel. And then the Python kernel is going to pass along the SAS output to the Python interface for us to display, allowing us to indirectly use SAS from inside Python scripts. So in order to demonstrate these principles, we're going to take you through a series of code vignettes. First, we're going to teach you the basics of Python, so introduce you to Python modules and imports, as well as basic Python syntax and object types. Then we're going to take your data on a round trip, importing a SAS data set from SAS into Python, doing some data manipulation, and then exporting it back to your SAS session. Then we're going to introduce you to the SAS data method, which allows you to interact with SAS data sets where they live on disk using Python syntax. And we're also going to show you how you can use Python to learn SAS if you want to. Finally, we're going to show you how you can use Python as a scripting language for SAS using SASPy in order to imitate the SAS macro facility. All right, this is section one. Python code conventions and data structures. For our first example, we're going to meet the Python environment. So on line one here, I'm going to import the platform module. Then we're going to use the print function to display both the Python version, which in SAS University Edition is 3.5.5, and the operating system information, which again in University Edition is this Red Hat Linux. Then on line four, the help function 
is going to be used to display this whole list of all of the modules we have installed in Python. Can you recognize any of the ones in the list here, Isaiah? Yeah, so the third column from the left, I'm noticing the name Jupyter several times, uh, including Jupyter Lab, which I believe is the Python package that generates the interface you're using right now. That's right. I'm also noticing uh, Pandas, uh, which is in the same column a little bit farther down, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. And then I think at the very end of that column, you'll see SASPy, which is kind of the highlight of our uh, tutorial. Along with the SAS kernel. That's right, which is running behind the scenes, allowing us to connect to a SAS instance and run SAS code inside Python. So I am noticing um, in terms of syntax that this looks a lot different than SAS, which might be something for SAS programmers to adjust to. Um, let's talk about the case of the code. Would it work if, like a SAS programmer, I put it all in uppercase? Right, so this is important to know that Python is case sensitive. So for example, if I say import platform all in uppercase, that will cause an error. Theoretically, there could be a module named platform all in uppercase, in which case using platform in uppercase would work, although import in uppercase would not. Yeah, so, so case matters. Uh, what about uh, semicolons? My pinky finger is getting a little itchy because I don't see semicolons at the end of the lines. Right. So semicolons are normally optional in Python. I can add one at the end of this line and that works just fine. The only situation where you do need a semicolon in Python is if you want to put multiple statements on the same line, in which case a semicolon is needed to mark the dividing between them. But in general those are not necessary, but they don't cause any problems either, so you're welcome to exercise your itchy pinky finger to your heart's delight. That's good to know. Uh, let's also talk about all the dots everywhere. That's a little different than SAS as well. Right, so Python is an object-oriented programming language, and this dot notation shows you when one object is nested inside another object. So we imported the platform module, and the sys object is nested inside of platform. Then the version object is nested inside of sys. So when we bring platform into the namespace, we get all of the objects nested inside it as well. Yeah, which is really helpful. I like to think of Russian nesting dolls or turduckens, where you have a chicken inside of a duck inside of a turkey. Sounds delicious. <laughs> well, I'm a vegetarian, so uh, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, let's also talk about quote marks. So I'm noticing you have single quotes, it looks like, around modules. What happens if we had double quotes instead? Good question. Single quotes and double quotes are usually the same in Python and that doesn't cause any problems if you want to use double quotes instead. That is purely a stylistic choice in most situations. Just like in SAS, but are there cases in Python where single and double quotes will have different behavior? No, so there isn't anything like the equivalent of the SAS macro resolution where you have to remember that macros will only resolve inside double quotes. Yeah, and I think that's important for SAS programmers because I think typically in Python code, the community convention is to always use single quotes. That's good to know. Yeah. One final thing, um, let's talk about the Python batteries included philosophy since we're talking about sort of the open source community around Python. Um, so we have to import packages because we don't want to use up a lot of memory having them loaded by default, so we load them as we need them. Right. Um, but why do we have so many packages to begin with? Well, while it's great that you can go out onto PyPI or GitHub and download whatever packages you want, it's also really nice to have a large number of packages available just when you download Python. It means whenever you install Python, there's a really wide variety of things you can do, which I think is nice. Yeah, without having to go and buy like separate things, you can just sort of automatically have a package for like drawing things on the screen or recording audio, all sorts of things by default. Right. All right, let's move on to exercise 
In example 1.2, we're going to introduce you to a basic data structure in Python, specifically the string or stir object. So first, we create a, a Python object named hello world stir on line 1, and then use the print function in order to display it. Then, we use the print function again to display a blank line, and finally, on lines 4 through 7 here, we have some conditional logic to test the value of the hello world stir object and print one message if it's equal to hello Jupiter and print another message if it's not. In this case, we just set the value. So obviously, we get the type function, which we're using to figure out that yes, hello world stir is of class stir. And clearly, this is just an excuse to show off conditional logic inside of Python. Uh, but what would happen if, say, after line three, we changed the value of hello, words, hello world stir? What if we made the value 42? Would that cause a problem? Good question. Let's try that. So obviously we get our error message that we ourselves wrote here when the value of hello world stir doesn't match what we wanted, but this doesn't actually cause an exception in Python. This is because Python has dynamic typing, so I can create it as a string up here and then assign it a, another value down here, and Python will just allow me to do that and change the type of the hello world stir object. So for example, if I change this condition here to check if hello world stir is equal to 42, we can see that the result is an object of class int. This is obviously quite different from something like a SAS data step where a variable once initialized as one type can't be given a value of another type even though the name of the variable is now a lie in Python, the uh, syntax still allows us to assign a new type. Yes, hopefully the audience will forgive us this small lie. Indeed. Let's also talk about the uh, use of the single and double equal signs. Do those mean different things in Python? They do. In SAS, a single equal sign is used both for assignment statements and also for conditional logic. But in Python, if you want to assign a value to an object, you have to use a single equal sign. And if you want to check the value of an object to test equality, you have to use two equal signs, which does make things a little less ambiguous. Which is always a good thing. Um, I'm also noticing uh, in terms of ambiguity that we have some indentation here. What would happen if we got rid of it? Yeah, so this is one of the most interesting features of the Python language, which is that white space actually has syntactical significance. So this indentation here is used to delimit scope and indicate that this statement will execute if this condition is true. And if I get rid of that, I will get an error because Python is expecting an indented block which I think is really important for SAS programmers who aren't used to white space being a significant part of the language syntax. Absolutely. Uh, I think a lot of SAS programmers enjoy being able to choose how they indent things and express themselves artistically. Uh, but I think there's a lot to be said for this approach in Python. Absolutely. I think it's good. It forces us to have good habits. All right, let's move on to example 1.3. All right, in example 1.3, we're going to introduce you to some basic Python concepts, specifically the list data object, and also the concept of an index in Python. So on line one, we create an object named hello world list, which is a list of two strings, hello and list. Then we print the value of that object, print another blank line, and we then use the type function to display the fact that our object is of class list. So let's talk about when we say list, is there a SAS equivalent to that? 
Yeah, so the most direct equivalent in SAS would be a data step array, which is to say it's a grouping of variables or data values, which can be accessed by using an index. So for example, if I want to print just the first element of this hello world list object, I can use the print function and then say hello world list bracket zero. And that'll display hello. So why zero? So a list in Python is always indexed starting at zero. So that is one important difference to keep in mind between a Python list and a SAS array because in a data step you can choose to index your data step arrays starting at pretty much any numeric value which is pretty convenient sometimes. But fortunately there are other data objects in Python that have more versatile indexing conventions. Which I think we'll see in the next example. All right, let's move on to example 1.4. In example 1.4, we're going to introduce you to the dictionary, or dict, which is an object in Python that allows you to map values to keys. So on lines 1 through 5 here, we create an object named hello world dict, which is a dictionary with three keys, salutation, valediction, and part of speech which are mapped to three values, each of which is a list of two strings. Whenever you see these curly braces in Python, in between them you'll find the definition of a dictionary. Then on lines 6 through 8 we print the value of the dictionary as well as the type of the hello world dict object, which of course is class dict. So you mentioned that uh, this is a dictionary, uh, which is a fundamental data structure inside of Python. In our last example, we looked at another fundamental Python data structure list, and we noticed that there was a SAS equivalent. Is there also a SAS equivalent for dictionaries? Right. So a dictionary is an example of what is called an associative array. And examples of associative arrays in SAS include both SAS formats as well as data step hash objects. Right, and I think also another synonym is the word map, and that I think is maybe helpful because we see this as a mapping between the keys and the values. So we have this one-to-one -one correspondence. Right. Now, yeah, so let's talk about the, the idea of a key. So how does a key correspond to like the idea of indexing a dictionary? Yeah. So if I create a new object named hello world salutation and then I assign that the value of hello world dict indexed to salutation then print the value of that new object you'll see that by using the same indexing notation from a list with the brackets and just passing it the value of one of the keys of the dictionary we can display the value mapped to that key. No, that's great. And then I'm noticing that the value is a list. So could we actually then use list indexing on the result? Yeah. So if in the print function here I add brackets and zero like we did in the previous example, then we can print specifically just the first element of the list, which is hello. So that's great. And then we could change it to one, and I'm guessing, and also get out the word dict. We can change that to one, and we can change salutation to one of the other keys, like valediction, and display the word list. That's great. So it's sort of like um, I can think of a dictionary in this sense as uh, like a matrix and I can sort of index things like rows and columns in a way. In a way and in fact we'll see in the next example that you can turn a dictionary into an object with rows and columns in the way you would expect in a matrix or a SAS data set. No that's great. Before we do that though just one final point. I noticed that when we create our dictionary 
we have salutation come first, then valediction, then part of speech. But then when we print it, part of speech comes first. Yeah, that is a good point. This is actually an artifact of the version of Python we're using. You'll recall from the first example that we're using version 3.5.5, which is actually a little bit old. In the most recent release of Python, you'll find that the insertion order of a dictionary is actually preserved. But in this version of Python, that's not guaranteed. And, and hopefully not important in most cases. I hope not. All right, let's move on to example 1.5. In example 1.5, we're going to introduce you to the concept of a Python data frame, which is the Python data object, which is the closest analog to the SAS data set. So because the data frame object is not part of Python by default, we do need to import the data frame object from the pandas module, which fortunately uh, is included with all of the modules in SAS University Edition. Then we can use the data frame constructor function, pass it a dictionary definition, and create a Python object which is a tabular data structure similar to a SAS data set. On lines 9 through 13, we print the, the hello world df object, followed by a blank line, as well as some information about the shape of our data set, another blank line, and finally some additional metadata. That's great. So let's talk about the uh, hello world df dot shape output. So I see like a, an ordered pair. Uh, 2 comma 3. What does that correspond to? So 2 co corresponds to the number of rows in the data frame and 3 corresponds to the number of columns, which as you can see also corresponds to the number of keys in the dictionary we had originally and 2 corresponds to the number of elements in each list in the dictionary. So in other words, I can think of like part of speech, salutation, and valediction as being like the the names of variables in a SAS data set. Absolutely. And yeah, and it looks like the zero and one are sort of like the row labels when I use proc print, except I'm starting with observation zero as the initial observation instead of observation one. Yeah, although it is also possible in Python to use a column as an index. By default, you'll get it indexed from zero to one the way you would in a list. Right, which I think is important. And so does that tell us then that we can use indexing just like we've seen in the last couple of examples on a data frame? Absolutely. So if I want to create another object here, so I can once again use the salutation key or in this case row label to create an object that just contains that column so if I print my new object you'll see that I have selected just the hello and data frame elements of the salutation column so we've extracted just the single column name salutation right and so can we then use list indexing on that column to get specific elements? Sure. Which would you rather see? Hello or data frame? Well, data frame, that's the star of the show. That makes sense to me. Yeah, so we can use the list indexing with brackets just like we did before and display just the value data frame. So that's great. And so that sort of corresponds to then like row index, column index, like I would think of with like a matrix or with a SAS data set. Uh, and so we can do this then nested indexing just like we did with dictionaries. And so we can sort of treat then a data frame kind of like a dictionary. But in our definition, I noticed if we scroll up a bit that when we were defining our columns, we always had two elements. What would happen if we tried to have one of the lists be a little longer or shorter? Good question. Let's try adding an element to this list. That does cause an error. 
unfortunately. Right, so I guess Python's not smart enough to fill in like missing values um, in the third row we're trying to create. Not smart enough, or perhaps the designers of this module thought they were protecting us from some potential problems by enforcing that. That's totally fair. So um, let's maybe then talk about one final thing about data frames that makes them different from data sets before we move on to section two. So I think it's really helpful to understand that a data frame lives in memory. And that's the reason that we can index and get specific elements out of it quickly. Whereas a SAS data set always lives in on disk, right? And we have to process it row by row, loading it from disk into memory and then back out of memory back to disk. Right. Although the potential downside to the data frame approach is that as your data approaches the size of available memory, things do become less efficient. And in fact, you can run into problems where you don't have enough space to put all of your data into a Python data frame in memory all at once. Yeah, that sounds like a really important trade-off to me between how Python does things and SAS does things. So in Python, you get this immediate access to things in memory. You can do this pinpoint indexing but you can't work with things that exceed the size of physical memory. So SAS has an advantage there in that you can work with arbitrarily large data sets, and you can't necessarily in Python. Yeah, I think this is a good example of an area where SAS and Python cover each other's weaknesses. Absolutely. And so then that's where we're so excited to have the best of both worlds, to get uh, just about anything done by using the right tool for the job. Absolutely. And this is section two, SASPy data round trip where we're going to start with example 2.1 and connect to a SAS kernel from inside of Python. So in this example, what you'll notice is that we start with an import statement. So we've seen import statements before. In this case, I'm using a relative import statement where I'm saying from the SASPy package, I want to just import the single object called SAS session. This is different then if I just said import SASPy, and if I were to say that instead, as an absolute import, I would have to put SASPy here in order to delimit the namespace where the SAS session object lives. But going back to the relative import statement, on line two, I'm creating a new Python object, which I'm calling SAS, and I'm setting it equal to a SAS session object that I'm initializing with an option called results, which tells me how I want my SAS results to be returned. Here I want my SAS results to be in HTML format, which is sort of the default you can imagine that you get inside of something like Display Manager. And then on line three, I'm printing the type of the SAS object, which you can see has this very long name with some dots in it using the Python object-oriented notation. So the type of object SAS, is, the definition for it is inside the SASPy object, and then the SAS base object nested inside of that, and then the SAS session object definition nested inside of SAS base. And so in the background, what happened here when I executed line two specifically is that Python went out and it used a default configuration that comes with SAS University Edition that tells Python, here's how to go to a SAS kernel that lives inside of SAS University Edition, and here's how to create a connection to it. The intention being that with that connection established, I'm then able to submit SAS code to that SAS kernel from inside of Python. And so in effect, what lines one and two do is they set up a connection that we're going to use in future examples inside of section two. So what would happen, Isaiah, if you were to invoke the SAS session object, but not store it in another object? If you just said SAS session results equals HTML, what would happen? Ah. Well, so Python would be happy to establish a SAS session. And so you can see here, SAS connection has been established. Here's my subprocess ID, if I'm interested in keeping track of that for some reason. But I'm no longer going to be able to access that SAS session since I haven't given it a name to use in future examples. So in other words, the SAS session has been created, but I'm now no longer able to access it uh, because I didn't that give it a name. That does seem like a waste. 
So what are all the options for this results parameter here? Do you have an option for every ODS destination or just HTML? So HTML is definitely there as an output destination. I can also use text, which is handy, for example, if we're working in an environment where we don't have access to rendering HTML. And I believe there's other options here as well, like pandas, if you want to get a data frame out instead of some type of static text or HTML to display. Um, there's definitely really good documentation for SASPy where all of those can be looked at. Yeah, up. so if you use pandas as your result, that's sort of like using ODS output in SAS, right? Because it... Exactly, to capture a table inside right. of a data set. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on to example 2.2, where we can actually use our SAS session object. In example 2.2, we're going to load a SAS data set into a data frame. In other words, we're going to take a SAS data set, a physical file that lives on disk, and we're going to load it into memory as a Python object in the form of a pandas data frame, like we saw in section one. If I execute this code, you'll notice that I get quite a bit of output that's going to appear here. And when we compare the output to the code, you'll see that it's in fact the first eight lines of code that are going to define an object called fish data frame smelt only. Line nine is going to print the type of that object. And you can in fact see it is an honest to goodness data frame, a pandas uh, object type whose definition is nested inside of frame, is nested inside of core, is nested inside the pandas module that we know and love and already saw uh, previously in section one. Then line 10 prints a blank line. And then line 11 is going to print by default the first five rows of the data frame fish df smelt only that was created above. You'll notice that there's also a little bit of um, output that I get about the object SAS, this SAS session, this connection to a SAS kernel. It's doing some work in the background to make sure it has a connection that it can send SAS commands to. We don't have to worry about that. That just sort of happens as things start and stop in the background. We get different process IDs. We don't have to keep track of any of that. But the point is that I am using this SAS object from our previous example, this connection to a SAS kernel, this SAS session object, and I'm using its method, SAS data to data frame, in order to load a physical file, a SAS data set from disk. And the SAS data set that I am loading lives in the SAS help library, and the exact data set name is fish. And so you can imagine this being the same thing as writing SAS help dot fish inside of SAS itself. In addition, I have a third argument to the SAS data to data frame method, which is called DS ops. And this is short for data set options. And so what you can imagine is that this is like how in SAS, if I were to write SAS help dot fish, and then in parentheses, put something like where equals species equals smelt, comma, obs equals 10, I can specify that I want to have SAS subset for me in real time, the data set to just get specific rows here where the condition species equals smelt is satisfied as well as just a fixed number of observations at most 10 rows where that where condition is satisfied. Here, I'm only printing the first five because I'm using the head function. But if I wanted to see more than that, I could say head 10 to see, in fact, the first 10 rows. In fact, all 10 rows. So if I change this to 20, you'll see that I again only get 10 rows indexed from 0 to 9, as we saw before, with 0 being the default initial index. Yeah, so I guess it's important that we're not writing out sashelp.fish here because otherwise you could easily get that confused with Python dot notation, huh? A slightly different meaning of the dot notation, indeed. So for the DS opts, could you also use other data set options like keep equals or drop equals? Yeah, absolutely. So I believe that there are analogs for most, if not all, of the data set options available to you in SAS. So if you wanted to just keep, for example, let's say the species column, 
and say the weight column. You can provide a, uh, a third key to your dictionary of options here with the uh, key being keep and then the value corresponding to that key being the list of strings where each of the strings is one of the names of the columns that you want to keep. So here I'm saying just keep species and weight, which you can see reflected in my output down here. And what if I want to, instead of seeing the first couple of rows of the data frame, I want to see the last couple of rows. Is there a function for that? Yeah, so that would be something we would do in Python. And maybe it's important to note here that as we're having SAS and Python interact, some things we do in Python, some things we do in SAS. So here the data set options are doing filtering on the SAS side so that I'm getting just a small amount of input into Python instead of getting all of the input and then having to do the filtering inside of Python. However, when I'm displaying things down here and I say, for example, let's say head two just to get the initial two rows, that filtering is happening in Python itself. And so if I wanted to do different filtering, I could either change the number here, like we saw before, like let's say two to four to get the first four rows. If I want to get the, the last few rows instead, there's the corresponding function tail. And so these are then the last four rows in the results that SAS is giving me um, that correspond to all of these conditions. All right, and so with that, we'll move on to example 2.3. So in example 2.3, we're going to learn how to use nothing but pure Python operations in order to manipulate a pandas data frame. And we're going to do that by loading the same SAS data set that we looked at in the last example, sashelp.fish. And we're going to do that using SAS, which is our persistent connection to a SAS session. So in other words, a way for us to submit commands to a SAS kernel to get things back. And we're going to again use the SAS data to data frame method in order to say, to take this SAS data set that lives on disk and to load it into memory as a pandas data frame, a Python object. So once I have done that, once I have loaded sashelp.fish into a data frame, I'm then going to go through a series of three manipulation steps. The first step is going to use a group by operation and so what this is going to do is it's going to group the rows in fish underscore df, my data frame, by the values in the column species. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subset just to the weight column. And then I'm going to aggregate the values in the weight column by these aggregation functions, count, standard deviation, mean, min, and max. And the idea here is that I'm creating a series of temporary data frames. So I'm taking up more and more system memory where each of these stores an intermediate results in the process of first doing a group by and then subsetting to a specific column and then aggregating values in that specific column. The results allow me to then see this new data frame down here, fish underscore df underscore gsa GSA for group by subset and then aggregate. And I can see that for each value of species, I can see the number of rows in the original data frame that correspond to that value. I can see the standard deviation for the values of weight in those rows corresponding to species breen. I can see the mean, the min, and the max also for the rows in the original data set that correspond to species breen. Yeah, so what we've essentially done here, I guess, is to build the Python equivalent of a proc means or a proc SQL with a group by clause, right? That's right, yeah. And so you can see the correspondence here between group by in Python pandas syntax versus group by in SQL. Um, but you can also see it, as you said, like being the equivalent of proc means where here I've used species as my classification variable and weight as my analysis variable. One thing we saw earlier is that in Python you can often chain things together, whether dot notation for nesting objects or indexes. Is there a way to chain some of these commands together? 
Absolutely there is, yeah. So here we decided to break it up across multiple lines just to sort of make it clear that there are three discrete operations that are happening. But there is nothing to stop me from in fact doing it all at once. So I can do my group by, and then I can chain that together with my subsetting. And then the results of that, I can chain together with my aggregation. And in fact, if we do that, we'll see that we get the exact same output. And not only do we get the exact same output, but it's actually much more efficient. When I create new data frames one after the other, it takes up a lot of system resources because I have to allocate new memory, I have to copy things over, that kind of thing. But when I chain things together into a string of operations that are all happening on the original data frame, fish underscore df, what happens is that Python will actually apply each of these in memory in place so that things actually are much faster because I don't have to do all that memory management behind the scenes to create multiple data frames in sequence. So just like in SAS, you might try to combine multiple operations in a single data step for efficiency. In Python, you can try to combine things in a single statement the same way. Absolutely, yeah. And you can also see this kind of as the analog before when we talked about putting multiple lines of Python on the same line with a semicolon between them. Sort of the same idea of just stringing together a bunch of commands all on a single data frame, all in a row. All right, and so with that, let's go ahead and move on to example 2.4. And lastly, in example 2.4, we're going to see how to complete our data round trip, where first we loaded a SAS data set into a Python pandas data frame. We did some manipulation inside of Python using only Python operations. And now we're going to take the results of all of our manipulation inside of Python, and we're going to stuff it back onto disk as a SAS data set. So literally a round trip from SAS to Python back to SAS again. And we're going to do that by again using our SAS object that we created before, which is a connection to a SAS session, meaning a way for us to submit commands to a SAS kernel somewhere living on disk from inside of Python. And we're going to use the analog of the SAS data to data frame method that we saw before, this time called data frame to SAS data to reflect the fact that we're starting with the data frame, an object that lives in Python, and we're going to get the result of a SAS data set, a file that actually lives physically on disk. And the data frame that we're going to turn into a SAS data set is the fish underscore df underscore gsa data frame that we made in the last example. We're going to give the name fish underscore SDS underscore GSA, SDS for SAS dataset, to the file that we're creating. And we're going to create it in the default work library that SAS defines whenever we start a SAS session. So that's what's happening on line one, is to basically do the inverse of what we saw in the previous two examples. So then, just to prove to you that we actually did create a SAS data set, again, a physical file living on disk, with line one, if I execute the rest of this example, what you'll see is that lines two to eight execute honest-to-goodness SAS code. So if you've been sort of saying, well, I can kind of see what's happening with the Python stuff, but I'm really much more familiar with SAS, well, this should look very familiar to you. This is honest-to-goodness SAS code. Right, this is the same proc print that you know and love, where I'm specifying a single data set that I want to print out, and then a run to say that I'm done with that program step. And you'll see that the name of the data set that I'm going to print is in fact the same as the name of the data set that I created here on line one. You'll also see that I'm specifying that I want the results of my SAS submission of this code to be returned in text which is why I just have nice text down here, like you might see in like listings output. And the way that I'm actually submitting just raw, honest to goodness SAS code to the SAS kernel that I'm connected to with my SAS session object that we called SAS, is I'm using its method called submit. And then you'll notice that in quotes, I'm putting the actual SAS code. And you'll notice that I'm using a trick here with what are called triple quotes. So triple quotes are a way of creating strings in Python that are allowed to have embedded line breaks. And so that's why I can have a line break at the end of line three, a line break at the end of line four, a line break at the end of line five, so that 
this is all one single string, so the parts that I have highlighted here, but with embedded line breaks so that I can make my SAS code much, much easier to read and see that it is in fact an honest to goodness, friendly proc prints statement here. Then once I get the results of submitting the SAS code to the SAS kernel and I store it inside of this object called SAS submit return value, I can then process that new variable that I've created and I can get things out of it. The first thing to know about the SAS submit return value object that's created is that it is in fact a dictionary, which is why you can see that I'm using indexing notation here with a string for the index value, just like we saw before with dictionaries. And so this string LST is the name of the key that corresponds to the value of the SAS results, the things that are actually printed right here. So in other words, this is the key, this is the value in the dictionary. And I am extracting that here on line nine, and then I am printing the results on line 10. So if LST is one key of the dictionary, what can you show us what's in the other key? So in fact, there's exactly one other key, and that key is log which allows me to see the log of the SAS session from submitting this proc print statement to the SAS kernel. So LST gives me the results, the actual things that I would see inside of SAS if I were to execute this, and log shows me the log of executing that code. And those are the, in fact, the only two keys of the dictionary that's returned from the sas.submit method. And so if you can submit arbitrary SAS code, Presumably you could run whatever procedure you want on the output of our pandas operations, right? That's right. I could change this to proc means, I could change it to proc core, whatever I want, and I will get honest to goodness SAS results back in this LST corresponding to this LST key of the SAS submit return value. And the SAS object we have here is the same as the SAS object we created all the way at the top of our round trip, right? So if we wanted, we could easily start this all over again and import from that session back into Python. That's right, yeah. So it's a persistent connection to a SAS kernel, which is why, in fact, I'm able to take this object that was created above and reuse it all within the same session. All right. This is section three, executing SAS procedures with convenience methods. So up until now, we've shown you how to connect to SAS and how to use that connection to bring SAS data sets into Python and take Python data frames and take them back to SAS as SAS data sets. In example 3.1, we're gonna show you how to connect directly to a SAS data set using Python syntax. So on the first line, I'm going to establish my SAS session again, just like we did last time, using the SAS session object from the SASPy module. Then on line four, we're going to use the SAS data method, which is different from the SAS data to data frame method we showed you in the last section. The SAS data method creates an object of class saspy.sasbase.sasdata and that object is essentially a file pointer to a SAS dataset on disk. So previously we showed you how you could read a SAS dataset into memory in Python and operate on it, but this method, the SAS data method, allows you to point Python at a SAS dataset where it lives on disk and operate it on SAS data sets without importing them to data frames. The column info method for our fish SDS object, which we've created, the output of the SAS data method, executes the SAS contents procedure on a SAS data set and displays the column information from the contents procedure output. 
Then on line 9, the describe method, again of our SAS data object, which we've named fish SDS, runs the means procedure and displays summary statistics for our SAS data set, similar to what we created in the last section, but without importing data to Python. So all of these, what we call convenience methods, are essentially Python functions that allow you to run some SAS procedure or snippet of SAS code and can operate directly onto SAS data without importing or exporting anything using only a file pointer at the SAS data set. Yeah, I think that's really cool. And I like that we can work with the SAS data set without having to load it into a data frame, especially when we want to actually use these convenience methods to run SAS procedures without having to directly code them ourselves. That seems really convenient to me. Yeah, it is really convenient because it allows you to interact with both the SAS system and SAS data sets using Python syntax and without having to explicitly import or export your data. Agreed. Yeah, the tricky part, though, seems to be how would I know that column info corresponds to proc contents? How would I know that describe corresponds to proc means? And how would I know all the available convenience methods and the SAS procedures they correspond to? Yeah, there is, of course, online documentation where you can read through the available convenience methods, but that's not a great answer. The output we get from the column info method and the describe method do tell us that this is the contents procedure and this is the means procedure. But again, if you had slightly different output settings, it might not say that. So we will see in the next section that there is a convenient way to get Python to report to you the SAS code that is being executed. And we might also use this chance to plug our GitHub page, where we have all of these notebooks that we are showing. And we actually have detailed notes for each example, including a link to the SASPy documentation and all the different convenience methods that are available. In example 3.2, we're going to show you how to display the SAS code, which is generated by Python, which hopefully will help get at the answer to Isaiah's question in the previous example. The teach me SAS function included with the SASPy module is activated by passing it a value of true. And when activated, it causes any convenience methods to not execute and instead just print the SAS code which is generated by the method. This means that if you don't already know SAS, you can learn SAS in part by getting Python to show you the SAS code it's writing. But even if you already know SAS, you might find this useful because you'd like to know exactly what Python is doing. Which I think is really great. One thing I'm noticing is that uh, true and false look a lot like things that we have in SAS. Do the Python versions of true and false also correspond to the values 1 and 0? That's right. So instead of true, I could say 1. And instead of false, I could say 0. And that would work just fine. Personally, what I find trips me up as a person coming from SAS is the case sensitivity we alluded to earlier, where false with a lowercase f is not actually false. So if I were to say teach me SAS false with a lowercase f and try to use other convenience methods afterwards, we would find that I would get an error and teach me SAS would still be turned on the next time I tried to use a convenience method. So it might be easier just to use one or zero or you can just try to remember you need to capitalize true and false. Yeah, which is interesting. These are some of the few default Python objects that are capitalized like that. So another thing I'm noticing is that this construction looks kind of similar to some things that we see in SAS. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of the ODS sandwich where you turn on output to a specific destination and then turn it back off. So should we call this the teach me SAS sandwich? 
Yeah, I think that's a good way to explain it. It is very similar to turning ODS on and off, or perhaps turning an option on and off. Uh, s some of you might consider using mprint this way in SAS. Before you execute a macro, you might turn options mprint on and then turn it off afterwards. So you can think of this as being either like an ODS sandwich or an options sandwich. Yeah, which I think is really cool to sort of see that parallel between how we do things in SAS and how we can do those similar types of things in Python. Uh, one thing I'm wondering is, uh, other than learning some SAS syntax, is there any value to the teach me SAS sandwich? Um, and so I'm wondering, for example, here we're saying that the describe method, uh, we get the proc means equivalent. Could I use that code somehow? Absolutely. So in the previous section, we saw the submit method that lets you submit arbitrary SAS code that you write out in a quoted string from Python. So for example, let's say you wanted to select a specific variable out of this sashelp.fish data set, but the describe method does not allow for any arguments to set the variables. Well, you could use teach me sass to get the code that's being created by the describe method, copy it, then create a new output object, and use the sass.submit method. Submit your code generated by teach me sass. and then print the LST object of your SAS output. And that way, you're able to modify what is being done by the convenience method, which otherwise you might not be able to do unless it already has arguments for the parameters you'd like to set. Yeah, that makes sense. So for example, if uh, the describe convenience method doesn't have a way to do a classification variable, I could get this code and then add a class variable like species to the proc means statement. Absolutely, the... you can do exactly that. I'm going to break this out across lines because I think that'll look better. But yes, you can add a class statement. and look at things by species. So that's really cool. So now I feel like Python is teaching me SAS. Well, there you go. All right, let's move on to example 3.3. .3. So just like we saw in the previous section, you could specify data set options when using the SAS data to data frame method to import SAS data sets into pandas data frames. You can also use SAS data set options when you're using the SAS data method. On lines one through four here, I've created a Python dictionary named class underscore dsopts, which specifies the where equals and keep equals options in SAS to keep the rows of the data set where sex is equal to f and the variables age and sex. Then when I invoke the SAS data method on line 5, I specify my dictionary for the dsopts argument. And then when I subsequently use convenience methods on this SAS data object, you can see that it only has observations where sex is equal to f, and it only has the sex and age columns. Yeah, and then I noticed you're using the dot head method that we saw before. Before though, we used it on a data frame. Here we're using it on a SAS data set directly. So that's kind of a cool equivalence. Yeah, so this is a good point. Earlier we mentioned how different Python modules have their own namespaces. In this case, head is a method nested inside the SAS data object, whereas previously we saw the head method nested inside 
the pandas data frame object. Technically, these are two different methods, but they've been given the same name because they're intended to do the same thing. So this is an example both of how the Python namespaces work and also of how you can operate on SAS data using essentially regular Python syntax. That's really cool. So before we saw also that there was a tail method that corresponded to head. Is there a tail method here as well? Well, let's try that. Sure enough, there is a tail method. And we can see that we are now looking at the last couple of observations in the SAS data set. Although you can see that we are skipping some observations since the observation number jumps a couple of times. And I'm guessing that corresponds to the uh, where filtering to only get specific rows. Exactly. Well, that's really cool. Yeah, so again, I think this is a good point to mention that there are links to all this documentation in the example files we have on GitHub. And last but not least, this is section four entitled Staying Dry, where dry is an acronym that stands for don't repeat yourself. And in particular, we're going to look at just a single example in depth where we're going to imitate the SAS macro processor. So this should hopefully be exciting to you, even if a bit more advanced in some of the things that we've done in the previous three sections. So in this example, I'm going to do something that should look entirely familiar. I'm going to start by using a relative import statement. And from the SASPy module, I'm going to import the SAS session object. I'm then going to create a SAS session, and I'm going to call that resulting SAS session just SAS for short. And I'm going to specify that the results that are returned to me should be in text format. If I execute this cell, it's going to take a moment to connect to the SAS kernel and to get some output. But what you'll notice is that the output looks like good old SAS output. And in particular, that I have the result of calling proc means twice. So let's look at how we got that. So on line three, what you'll notice is that I'm doing nothing more than creating a string object inside of Python. The only difference from the previous string objects that we created are that I have this special interpolation part with a percent sign followed by s. So this is a way of doing what's called string templating inside of Python. This is a bit more advanced than the types of things that we do with strings in SAS. But you can kind of think of it like this is like me using an ampersand in the name of a macro variable inside of a string inside of SAS. The difference being, though, that here you'll notice that I'm doing this reference, but that I'm not actually specifying what this value should actually be anywhere. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in a value in place of the percent %s farther down below in the code when I use the SAS code string here and I use the percent sign again to say that whatever value is in this new variable dsn should be put in place of the percent s. So in other words, I'm going to reuse this string. I'm going to not repeat myself by having all of the other parts of the string written out more than once. And I'm going to fill in values repeatedly in place of percent s. And those values that I'm going to put in place a percent %s as I do what's called iteration using a for loop, it's the example of like a do loop inside of SAS, is I'm going to iterate and have dsn take on first the value fish and then the value class by having dsn take on the values in this list of strings in sequence and then to execute the body of the for loop for each value that DSN takes on. Just like in an example we saw previously, you can see here that the indentation is significant because it's delimiting this block of code that's going to be repeated multiple times, once for each iteration of the for loop. And so this then gives you a full example of how to do every type of flow control you might want to do inside of Python. First with if then branching like we saw before, and now with looping using for loops. Python, by the way, also has other ways of looping, like a while loop, but it's typically more common to use for loops and to always have our loop go over a fixed length list 
in order to avoid any type of infinite loops. But that's just an aside. So the idea here is that for each iteration of the for loop, you'll notice that I'm again using the sat submit method that we've seen in multiple examples. And what I'm going to submit to SAS is in fact a single string. And again, that's going to be the SAS code fragment with the value of DSN in place of the percent %s in my string template that I created here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to store the results of SAS submit inside of this variable, SAS submit return value. So we saw this before where I have this intermediate variable that stores the results of the SAS submit call. And then I'm going to remember that the results of SAS submit, so in other words, the type of the variable SAS submit return value is a dictionary. And then I can index that dictionary and I can get out the value corresponding to the key LST, which means the SAS results that are returned, as opposed to the log, which I could get out instead if I wanted. In fact, you can see here that if I change this to log, I get two SAS log instances, each corresponding to proc means, that has been run first on sashelp.fish and then on sashelp.class. And what you should notice is that line four, when I define my string template and I say proc means data sashelp.something run, looks exactly like what I'm getting in the log here except that in place of the percent %s, I have fish, the first value that my index variable DSN takes on. And then I get proc means data equals sashelp.class, where class is the second value that DSN takes on in the second iteration of my for loop. And so basically what I've done then is I've written the Python code that allows me to create a string template and make repeated calls to proc means in order to stay dry, to not repeat myself by writing out all of the sort of boilerplate parts of the proc means call over and over again, and instead just change the data set that I want to apply proc means to, just like we might do with the SAS macro facility. But you'll notice with quite a lot less code and with quite a few less ampersands and percent signs. Yeah, we're calling this imitating the SAS macro processor, but this actually does some things that would be relatively difficult in a macro loop much more simply, because we don't need to scan across a list or create a series of separate macro variables to iterate across. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, I think this is uh, yet again a good time to plug our GitHub, where I'll mention that you can find a uh, downloadable Jupyter notebook file of this example, along with a complete version of the equivalent SAS code that you would write using the SAS macro processor to do this exact same thing. And what you'll notice is the code is like three to four times longer because it takes a lot more work to in Python, or excuse me, it takes a lot more work in SAS to do this kind of indexing trick where I want to iterate across a list of strings. So I'm what on, one thing I'm struck by looking at this is that if you were learning SAS using SAS Pi, you could use Teach Me SAS, which we showed you in the previous section, to get the SAS code generated by a convenience method, edit it to do exactly what you want with the submit method, and then you could easily iterate on that to operate across a series of data sets or variables using a for loop. Yeah, absolutely. So there's no reason that you couldn't have gotten the code behind the convenience method described in the last section of examples, pasted that right here, put in this string templating element, the percent %s. It's always just percent %s, just use that as is. And then when you want to put something in place of percent %s, just again use the percent sign and then whatever string you want to put in place of percent %s afterwards. All right, so and with that, um, I know that we've gone through a lot of examples, we've covered a lot of ground, but I do want to, again, encourage you to go to our GitHub, download all of our example files, see all of the detailed notes, and even the exercises that we've included for each example, which will allow you to, at your own pace, explore and further enhance your understanding. And we do want to really take this opportunity to thank you for the opportunity to uh, work with you on this 
and to keep in touch. In fact, on our GitHub, we have complete instructions for how you can replicate all of these examples, including how to join our Gitter community, where you can talk with us, ask us questions about any examples or anything beyond that you would like to ask. So uh, thank you, and we will now move on to our closing slides. All right. Thank you so much for viewing our virtual SAS Global Forum session. At this time, we'd like to issue you a call to action, encourage you to look up our GitHub repo linked at the bottom of the slide, which will show you examples that allow you to replicate all of the exercises we've shown you today. Also, please feel free to reach out to us on Gitter to ask any questions you have. And finally, we'd like to encourage you to please go check out all of the other great SAS Global Forum 2020 virtual sessions on this channel. Please do. And if none of that made any sense to you, all you have to know, all you have to remember is go to github.com slash sas where once again, BFF stands for best friends forever, because we hope that we've convinced you that you should see SAS and Python as friends that will be inexorably linked together and used each to the best of their strengths moving forward in all of the work that you might try to do with data analytics or otherwise. And in fact, we have a but wait there's more moment for you. Because you've been such a great virtual audience, we do have a very brief demo and instructions for replicating this demo are also on our GitHub page link at the bottom of the slides, github.com slash saspy-bffs, where we show you how to break outside of the SAS University Edition environment and how to replace JupyterLab as a Python interface with PyCharm, where PyCharm is one of the most popular IDEs, integrated development environments, for using Python all on its own, all by itself. And in particular, using the instructions on our GitHub, you'll be able to take actual production Python code, run it inside of PyCharm, and have Python talk to a SAS kernel independent of what's provided in SAS University Edition. And this allows us to combine the strengths of Python here for web development, as we'll see in the demo uh, in just a moment, with the strengths of SAS for data analytics. So without further ado, let's go ahead and transition to our demo. So what you're seeing now is PyCharm, which is an integrated development environment, aka an IDE for the Python language. And at first glance, it probably looks a lot different than the SAS Display Manager. But uh, I wonder, uh, Matthew, do you see anything that looks similar to you? Yeah, well, we, we do have a, a code editor window with color-based syntax highlighting and a uh, browser tab on the left. So in some ways it's superficially fairly similar to the SAS Display Manager or maybe SAS Studio, but the function of that browser window on the left is a little different from the way it would be usually in Display Manager. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that the main difference is that in SAS, I'm usually wanting to see a list of data sets that have been created within my session. But here, I have a bunch of files that I've written that are intended to work together to create a Python web application. And so the emphasis is really then on making many files that work together rather than many data sets because Python is a much more general purpose language. And in particular, we have two files here that we should point out. One is called app.py. And this file is a, a Python script that looks a, a bit more involved than any of the Python we've seen so far. We'll come back to it though and talk about its contents in detail in a bit. The other file is called sasconfig uh, underscore personal.py. And this is the file that does all the magic because this file allows us to have a freestanding Python installation and to configure it to know how to talk to a freestanding SAS installation. And in fact, that's what all of this is doing here, is it's telling Python where to look for SAS. And it's saying these are the Java middleware pieces to use to talk to the SAS kernel in order to submit code to it and have it give us SAS results back. And so these two files, along with some others, work together so that we get a fully running web application. 
And so I will run that application for you now. And you'll notice that there's a lot going on here. This kind of looks like the SAS log in a way where I'm seeing that um, there is a, a Python interpreter being initiated and it's running a certain Python module. I'm seeing here the same kind of message we saw in University Edition about a SAS session being created. Here's a subprocess ID. Make sure you pay attention to that. There will be a quiz later. And then the rest of this is output from the Flask module, which is Python, one of the many actually, Python modules for writing web applications. The point though is that once it's gotten all stood up and bootstrapped and all that, I can click on this link and it will take me to a web browser that is connected to a web server running on my laptop. So you might recognize the IP address 127.0.0.1 as being localhost, meaning your local machine. So again, there's a web server running on my local machine. And so this is the way I access it on port 8000. So this is a web application that I could put on a web server and run for anyone in the world to access. But here the web server is just on my local machine and I'm accessing it with my web browser. So what you're seeing right now is all Python. And the first part of how this script is intended to work is by providing a full directory path. And so here the directory path that I'm going to give it is for the SAS help folder on my Windows machine. So this is where the SAS help data sets all live. I'm gonna click submit. So again, this is all Python that's working here. The Python script will look in the current directory and it's going to find all of the SAS data sets. And it's going to do that by finding all the files that end in .sas7bdat, which is the extension, the file extension for a SAS data set. And then the way this application is intended to work is you pick one of these data sets using this HTML uh, form element and to then click one of these buttons. And it's only when these buttons are clicked that SAS is springing into action in the background. And so what's actually happening at this very moment is that SAS is being told by the Python web application to go and find this file, fish.sas7bdat, this SAS data set that's living on disk, and to run proc contents on it. Similarly, I could run proc means on the same fish data set, so sashelp.fish. I can also run proc freak on sashelp.fish. And this is called Dataset Explorer because it's a relatively quick way of being able to quickly explore the data sets in a directory and to be able to switch between different data sets and understand them all in sequence. Yeah, if you're an experienced SAS programmer, you can probably imagine how something similar to this might help you automate some of the common data exploration tasks you have to do every day. Or alternatively, you could adapt this in order to make it easier for some of your coworkers who aren't SAS programmers to interact with your data. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is just intended to be a proof of concept. Um, and in fact, the code for all of this is on our GitHub, which we've talked about several times. So github.com slash saspy dash BFFs, BFF standing for best friends forever. Because by the time you've watched this tutorial, we really want you to see that you can use SAS output together with things like Python based web applications in order to get literally the best of both worlds and have SAS and Python be literally best friends forever allowing you to leverage the strengths of both to create something even better than you could do with one or the other. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the magic behind how all of that works. So this is the application code. It's the same code that's on GitHub, the same GitHub page that we were just looking at. And I'm curious, Matthew, after having gone through four sections of Python examples, what parts of this Python code stand out to you as familiar? Well, on lines one through five, we can see a series of relative imports, which if you'll recall, we did several times during our session to import various modules and objects for use in a Python script. There's also down below a couple of instances on lines nine through 15, and then again on lines 18 through 22, where we were defining dictionaries 
which you should remember from section one as being a list of keys mapped to values. What are the function of these two dictionaries in this app here? That's a good question, yeah. So when I'm writing a web application, I'm always concerned with preserving the state of the application. So in other words, keeping track of what has the user clicked on, uh, what information have I had to c collect and compile together in order to respond to user commands and input. And so here, the response contents dictionary is my way of storing all of that. So you remember that the application asked us for a directory. Well, the directory will be stored as the value associated with the directory key. And sorry, uh, PyCharm is trying to overly be helpful here. <laughs> so we have the directory key uh, and the directory value, which currently is an empty string. But you can imagine that later on, I would want to change the value associated with the directory key in order to keep track of the directory the user has entered. Similarly, there's the directory list key that's going to be starting as an empty list, but later it'll be a list of file names that were found in the directory. There's a specific data set that's been selected, and maybe there's errors that happened along the way, that kind of thing that I want to keep track of. Uh, this, by the way, is where we see some tricks with HTML, where I want to use what's called an iframe to embed SAS output, which comes to me as an HTML page inside of the main page. So that's why it's iframe file name as the uh, name of that key. Then this dictionary is actually a little bit different and perhaps more interesting because you don't need to play with the response contents dictionary if you're going to try to download and modify this. Instead, you're probably going to want to play with this dictionary, which maps the strings that uh, are just arbitrary strings that correspond to the text in the buttons in the web application as the keys. And it maps those keys to values that are actual SAS code. And it's templated SAS code, just like we saw before, with the percent %s, so this should look very similar to section 4 when we looked at our example of having Python imitate the SAS macro system. And so the idea is that these percent %s's are going to be placeholders that I'm going to fill in below with actual data set names. And that's why this is a, li a library temp lib dot and then a SAS data set name is going to be put in place of the percent %s. And so you could imagine then I could add additional SAS commands, like maybe I want to run proc core or proc reg or something like that, just by having additional dictionary entries in the SAS commands dictionary. And then below, I could imagine expanding the logic of the application, which is a bunch of if then else kind of constructions, which expand on the example from section one of if then else kind of things where based on what the user does, like they reset the page or they submit a directory, you can see that I'm updating the contents of the uh, response contents dictionary by setting values for specific keys. And that in the end, what I'm doing is based upon what the user selects, I'm then using a sas.submit, just like we saw throughout this tutorial, and I'm using the SAS commands dictionary, and I'm indexing it by the command that was given. So this is the key that I'm passing to the dictionary in order to retrieve the value. And then I'm doing the string substitution, just like we saw in section four, in order to do a submission on a specific SAS command. And really, as long as you were to update any of this business logic that had to be changed to have specific new SAS commands available to the user, all you would have to do is update the business logic and then also add those possible commands to the SAS command dictionary. So that is sort of in a thumbnail some of the things that we've seen that are very familiar uh, based upon the um, tutorial contents do you see anything else that maybe is out of scope from the tutorial itself, Matthew? Well, for example, I don't think we've talked about what's going on on line 25 with the at sign. And I don't think we've shown a lot of examples of defining a function in Python. 
So there are some interesting Python features, which hopefully people will go and learn about on their own time if they're interested. Absolutely. And I think the interesting thing to note, though, is that I've tried to write this application in such a way that you really don't need to understand the concept of decorator. So decorators are when you have these at signs. You don't really have to understand the concept of writing functions. So that's when you write this DEF for define a function. And you don't have to understand things like what is a global variable in Python, that kind of thing. You don't have to necessarily even understand how the Flask application framework works, where you have this uh, way of building web applications. But instead, you can sort of see this as a boilerplate, a template, for being able to add new SAS commands uh, at will and being able to have the Python application expand to your needs. And so that has been a very, very quick whirlwind tour of this demo. We do want to remind you that the demo is available on GitHub and that it is intended to be aspirational because we don't want to just show you sort of toy examples, but instead we want to show you how you can actually legitimately build things that you could use in the real world for your projects that combine things like SAS output with Python-based web application frameworks. Because we think that's a really exciting and interesting thing. And in fact, in my day job, I actually use this Dataset Explorer on a regular basis because it's a lot faster than writing a bunch of proc contents calls, personally. The other thing I want to mention is that on our GitHub, we're currently in the process of building a code repository specifically for this tutorial. And so by the time this video is on YouTube, this repository should be all built out and ready for you. And as mentioned, it will have complete instructions for you to be able to replicate all of the examples that you saw, all of the toy examples that we started with, as well as how to replicate the Dataset Explorer demo so that if you really want to take the PyCharm challenge, if you want to download PyCharm, if you want to download Python, if you want to write a config file that tells Python, here's how to connect to my local installation of SAS, you too can actually get to the point where you are using SAS and Python together, literally getting the best of both worlds, either as a hobby or even in your day job. So I think that's where we'll leave it for today. We really, really appreciate all of your time, all of your energy. And if you do want to get a hold of us, if you ever want to talk anything with SAS or Python, you can probably tell that we're pretty uh, excited about sharing all of this with you. We do want to mention that on each of our GitHub code repositories, we do have this button called Chat on Gitter. Gitter is a way of talking with people, sort of instant messaging, Slack, that kind of thing. But it's specifically where you can authenticate using your GitHub credentials so that you don't have to create yet another account. And we do hope that you all, after seeing this, will be encouraged to go and get a GitHub account if you don't already, and to interact with the incredibly vibrant open source community that's there. And to log into our Gitter, uh, there's instructions for how to do that also on um, GitHub. Like You can click this button, or there's instructions that you'll find in the uh, tutorial repo that will be built out by the time you can see this. And uh, let us know. Hit us up, and we'd love to talk more with you. So thank you. And uh, anything to add, Matthew? Nothing except to say thanks you so much for staying with us for this virtual session. And we hope that you will take the challenge to try some of this stuff in the wild. Absolutely. We know this isn't the same as seeing us in person at SAS Global Forum 2020. Because of current events, we had to do this virtually. But uh, let's keep in touch. And uh, we really hope to see you at SAS Global Forum 2021 in person. So thank you.